Steve Owen, HR Podcast. Mega. Right. Um, documentary went out on... Documentary. What do you call... What do they call it? Go yeah, on. it was a documentary. Documentary yeah. Went, yeah. went out on Tuesday. Yeah. Saw you on that. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're in the fucking studio. Yeah. <laughs> Mega. Nice to have in you. Run, uh, run Royal Welsh. Yeah. Right. You are... You're, so what's your position with Woody's Lodge? Um, I'm the West and Mid Wales project manager. For Woody's Lodge? Yeah. And uh, I, will, let's, I want to carry on the conversation we're having outside before yeah. this about... Um, the fucking hundred odd mile extravaganza that you 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 <laughs> so yeah. decided with one leg to walk and well one and a bit legs to walk hundred and thirteen miles was it yeah that was that was the plan um, so it, it started off really um, as as I do just thinking in my head what am I going to do um, so it started off um, applying to set a world record so it was going to be a twenty four hour challenge um, and the furthest distance walked as an above knee amputee. Um, over 24 hours. Has anything like that been undertaken by anyone else before? Yeah, it has. Um, the, the, the record was 60 kilometers in 24 hours. Um, so, me being me, um, I applied to Guinness World Records um, to set to sort of um, set the record. Um, and it went from there. And during the time I was waiting for, obviously, the application to go through and everything like that, um, the Afghan withdrawal happened. And... Um, obviously there was a lot of bad press, a lot of bad media, you know, I, I served out there, you know, along with, you know, yourself and thousands of other guys, um, and girls and girls and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> got to get that one in. Um, but, and guys used to be girls and girls used to be guys. Yeah. That's, that's, um, different topic, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, equality and all that, but and there was there was people just saying like these guys you know fought for nothing lost limbs for nothing died for nothing and I was like <laughs> it wound me up I, I was sitting there and it and it wound me up and what wound you up? just just this you know everybody saying like you know they died for nothing and things like that and you know it was coming from guys that hadn't even been out there hadn't even experienced that that environment you know and I thought right. I'll do something to, to remember these guys and to just get it out there. Do you know what I mean? So I, me being me, um, put it straight on social media, right? I'm going to walk 457 laps of a 400 meter running track. One, one lap for each, for each guy that, and girl that passed away in, um, in Afghan. So it went from there really. Um, I posted it out on social media and then it got to about four weeks before the actual event and I realized what I'd done <laughs> and the severity of it. I did the maths in my head and I was like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> this is, this is going to be hard. So back in, back in sort of um, June, I'd already, I'd already done another event. Um, I walked 85 miles from, from Barry to um, Llandesil, where, where Woody's Lodge West is based. Over what period of time? Over, over seven days. So I did about 12 mile a day because um, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, during the time I've been an amputee, which, is, which was five years last week, um, I've always tried to push myself a little bit further every time I do something. Um, and it always gets a bit more extreme and I always end up, you know, doing something. So the 85 miler happened and the idea behind that was to push myself mentally to see how far, you know, I, I like to hit the reset every year. So push myself to breaking point and then see how it goes. But it didn't actually happen that way. I actually got stronger as I went on. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a strange experience. So 5th of November came. Um, and ended up setting off on the on the command and running track, um, do, doing the laps. Um, I've got to say, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You didn't stop, did you? You kept, kept just kept going, yeah. Um, stopping for like five, ten minutes just to have some food and so have, have some water. And you know, between between five o'clock on the Friday and midnight, we, we'd banged in eighteen miles. Do you know what I mean? So um, we were going at a good pace, probably a little bit fast to begin with. Um, I think if I'd have gone a bit slower at the start, I probably would have, you know, been all right a bit 
a bit further on, but as as it went, we got to five o'clock, so we were 24 hours in now, and I'd pretty much doubled the world record. On 5pm on the Saturday? On 5pm on Saturday, um, I'd pretty much doubled the world record then over 24 hours, but I ha- I couldn't do it officially. I couldn't get all the all the things signed off and that purely because it was just too much admin to sort out. So by the time the application for the world record had come in, I was only two weeks away from from the event. So all of the admin that had it, and they, it was ridiculous. Like they, like they, what? they wanted like to film the whole twenty four hours. Um, they wanted um, two independent independent witnesses to log each lap and put a time down for each lap. You needed two specific stopwatches um, and a third one for you to carry. Oh, it was just. And it just went on and on and on and on and on the list of stuff. So I was like, you know, it's going to take me away from from what I want to achieve. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I know. And the guys that were there knew what I'd done. So, um, yeah, we did nearly probably just under 120 kilometers in 24 hours. So, um, yeah, that was hard going. And then from that point, then my body started shutting down. Um, what, the 5 p.m. kind of thing? Yeah, so everything started hurting, cramping up. 26 hours in then, two hours after, five, well, it's about 7 o'clock on the Saturday, I felt my foot break. So, and that was my good foot. How so, did you feel it? What happened? So I was just, I was walking, and I could feel the, the foot well, swelling. What do you mean is your good foot? Your other one yeah. is plastic, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Titanium, <laughs> <My> actually. <good> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my biological foot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I could just feel it swelling and swelling in my trainer um, to the point where I had to take, I nearly had to cut the trainer off off that I had on <coughs> to put on another trainer, which was already broken in. It was at the end of its life sort of thing. So I put that on and then that just kept swelling and I just felt I just felt a snap in my foot. Um, but funny enough, when, when that snap happened, the pain went. It was, it, it, it was a, a bit of a surreal experience. Um, and yeah, things from that point then just got harder and harder and harder until the point where we had to start doubling the names that we were putting on the board because I couldn't, I, you know, I hundred percent wanted to finish it, but it wasn't real. I'd still be walking now if I, if we hadn't had done what we did. So, um, yeah, we, we carried on walking. Um, we got to about four o'clock in the morning and I thought I was going to die. Um, sat in the sat in the chair and everything just started cramping up from my from my sort of toes to my to my chest to my head to my neck. I was getting pains across my chest, and I was like, "This is where I'm going to take my last breath." And I was fully committed by this point. <laughs> you know, I wasn't I wasn't I, I like I, I briefed the guys up before I started off, and I said, "I'm not leaving the track unless it's on a stretcher." <laughs> and I got defib pads attached to my chest, so um, they knew they knew what I was like, and I'm I'm quite headstrong, so. Yeah, at that point then I thought, right, I've got to move. I've got to get up and I've got to do something. So got up and it took me 45 minutes to walk 400, 400 meters. <laughs> yeah, I was in I was in a bad way. Um, so next time I sat down then I started hallucinating because of the lack of sleep. What were you seeing? Oh, the, the gazebo that I was sat in was trying to eat me basically. It was like, I, I like nodded off for like 30 seconds and I, I, I jumped up and I was like, shit and the, the gazebo was all over my face but it wasn't if there was a camera there they would have seen me fighting <laughs> fighting ghosts so <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite funny um yeah then we just we just cracked on and got to sort of like nine o'clock in the morning then and people started turning up um and it was uh, it was like i had like a third wind and i but everybody was like saying are you okay <laughs> Because like my my eyes were all bloodshot, my body, my my posture had all changed, and it was like, um, yeah. So the missus turned up then, and she was like, she was like, are you, are you sure you're going to be able to do this last lap? And I was like, I'm doing it, whether <laughs> whether you like it or not. So yeah, I got to about eleven o'clock then, and we we did the last lap. Um, oh, on Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, yeah. So we we started five p.m. on the Friday. And ended up finishing eleven half eleven on the on the Sunday morning, which was um, yeah got got a bit emotional. 
Um, when you get to the stage, you're hallucinating, mate. Yeah. I I remember the first time I got that tired. I I don't think many people ever experience that level of tiredness that you hallucinate, like yeah. properly hallucinate without the, without the need for drugs. Yeah. <laughs> I was in. It was a. You don't think back now. I think how did I think that was real? It was a. We were on a defense defensive exercise. First one been done in fucking decades. By the, by um by. Three power thing, like properly defensive, big defensive. Ten days long, we dug in stage three trenches, yeah. you know, the works, and it was like day two. <laughs> it was yeah. We just been we tab massive tab in, been digging for nonstop. Anyway, got uh, we got uh, stood two, and it was roasting, boiling hot. I can't remember where we were doing it. it might have been Salisbury, roasting, boiling hot. It was boiling hot day, and that, you know it, it's hot. And you try to stay awake, and I looked across to the trench to my right. And the session commander, a guy called Screech, and he's and he's we couldn't get out there, it was just fucking boiling. The sun is beating down. I looked across the <laughs> Screech, and he's there, stood two with his rifle in his shoulder, looking over the top of the parapet. But he had a Carlsberg beer umbrella above him, <laughs> like giving him a shade. I thought, you fucking wanker. And then I realized that's what, it's not real. That's not real. Yeah. That's not real. Yeah, fucking hell. Yeah, one of one of the one of the lads of Thai he was walking with us. He um I think this was about four o'clock in the morning. Um <laughs> And he jumped all of a sudden. I went. I went to grab something, and I, I was like, y- "You're right." He goes, "He goes, the fucking lines jumping out on me on the running track." <laughs> and then we just started laughing, and it was like, "The, the shit's just got real." The, you know, everybody's starting to hallucinate now. You know, uh, but fair play to them two guys. You, you know, Derek and Ty. They they walked with me like the whole way. You know, so they they, they were in the hurt locker just as much as I was. Yeah, fair play. Yeah. What did it feel? What was it like when you actually finished with that sense of accomplishment and the emotions you mentioned just now? Yeah, it was it, it was a bit of a strange one. I'd left I left my regiment to the last to do to, to walk the last lap. By this point, we were putting like four names on the board, you know. So, um, I did I did my la- the regiment as a one, you know, remembering the guys that we lost and and things like that. And that I wasn't I wasn't sure how I was going to react. Um, you know, I had, a, I, had a, I had a couple of tears running down my face and a, a lump in my throat, and um, yeah, I put the last name on the board, and it just then then the severity of what I've just done sunk in. Um, but yeah, and and I was adamant that I was going to lay a reef at the bottom of, bottom of the board, so it did that, and just the amount of support of the guys turning up um, was was amazing. Just seeing people. You know, giving up, giving up their Sunday really, just to come and come and cheer me on on the last on the last lap. You know, some of our trustees they're organising um, a cycle ride from um, Cardiff to Paris next year, um, and they used one of their training days to come down and see me. So they cycled from Bridgend down to Carmarthen to see me, which was which again was it was humbling more than anything. Um, but I, I guess I'm still in the euphoric stage of it, really. You know, after completing the event, because I, 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 I can't quote this, but you know, the amount of mileage I did as an as an above knee amputee in what in one go, I don't think has ever been done ever before. So, um, I'm still trying to process that. Um, I couldn't fit my leg on two days in a row. Tried, but it wouldn't it wouldn't go in. My my stump had swelled that much. I just couldn't physically get it in the socket, and. Um, couldn't get my trainer on the other foot either, so <laughs> stuck to your Crocs. Yeah, well, I couldn't even get it in a Croc. Why yeah. do you own Crocs? I was joking. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extreme measures, break glass in emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something about when you do stuff like that. <clears throat> I did a <clears throat> nothing like you did. I did. We did a little memorial walk. I mean, little over the Malverns, um, and that's why I asked you what it was like when you finished finish like the emotional side of it we did a memorial walk for a guy who took his own life a few years back and um final way through it you know and then finished and as soon as as soon as we finished as soon as we finished it burst into tears <coughs> couldn't control it burst into tears like what well, you're saying it's, it wasn't so much it wasn't uh not the accomplishment because it, it wasn't like i said we weren't doing anything like what you what you did it was just it was the the what's the word what it symbolised, yeah, you know, a remembrance thing, yeah, you know, and uh, or and, and plus when you're drained physically like that and mentally, yeah, I think when with those kind of emotions when they take over, they just hit you f- for six. Oh even yeah, bigger. It's it's that phys. I I went through three phases on that walk. I went through the physical barrier into the mental phase, 
and I wanted the physical barrier to come sooner than the <coughs> mental phase, but the physical barrier didn't come come till later. And I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting it because I thought I was going to be in the hurt locker a lot sooner than I was. Um, and then went into sort of like the mental mental phase of it then. Um, and then it got it got to the point where I came out of that and I was just coasting. And that was, I, I think it was the most dangerous part of that because you're not fully aware of what's going on, you know. And like I was saying, I was sat there and everything started cramping up. And I think if I had a bit more mental capacity at that time, I probably would have... I, you know, I wanted to stop. I wanted to throw the towel in. And I remember sitting on the chair just, like, completely fucked. And I looked up at the board and i just seen all these names on there. I thought, you can't you can't just throw the towel so in. So you now. were ticking off a name on each lap? Then, yeah, so so basically about two weeks before, I'd printed off all of the guys' names that passed away um, in, in Afghan and cut them out, laminated them all, cut them out again. And then we basically, we had a, a full sheet of plywood um with velcro strips on and we carried the name with us and put it on the board oh, right. so it you was were carrying all the names around with you as you're walking then yeah each lap yeah stick one on the board yeah so as as we would walk we would call out call out the name and then c carry it with us and put it on the board holy then. shit yeah so it was um so every lap meant something yeah so a lot of, a lot of people said oh was it boring just going around in circles you know, for two days straight. And I was like, not really. I didn't even, I, to be honest with you, I didn't even look at my surroundings because I knew it was going to be, you know, monotonous, walking around a 400 metre track 457 times. So by carrying the guys' names with us, it was it was like a fresh lap every time. You know I mean, because we're doing it for that person. Um, I did lose my, my, my rag a little bit when we had to start doubling the names up because... My, in you know me personally, I I was like, oh, fucking, you, you know, you failed at this, but realistically, you know, we still put all the names on the board. We still, you know, and we still, you know, it was four hundred for four five seven. That was what we called the event. So it, it meant something. Do you know what I mean? You, you know, when I was still there at the end, and I still put the names on the board. So yeah, it got a bit. Um, Got a bit emotional, but you know sometimes you have to you have to be realistic. Well, yeah, still like I said, <coughs> it's an amazing achievement. Everyone got yeah. representation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, did the did you have to battle with any of the uh, the local running running uh, the running teams and stuff going <laughs> no. and train it? No, <laughs> the so, did so they close it off you for the whole time. Did they? Pretty much, yeah. They kind of like there was supposed to be a football match in the middle of the in the middle of the rugby track um, uh, running track. Sorry. Um, but they managed to like postpone it or move it somewhere else. I I, I was looking forward to that because it would have been something to look at. <laughs> but it got it, it it got rough on the Saturday because about seven o'clock in the morning it started <laughs> raining and didn't and didn't stop till seven o'clock that night. So yeah, you know what it's like. You just piss wet through and you're just like, what have I done? You know, and <laughs> yeah, keep thinking about the end goal. Keep thinking about. And another thing I I do when I'm like doing stuff like that. I, I try and visualize the finish. So if I visualize the finish, that's what I, that's where I want to go. So I know, I know it's bad news if I can't visualize the finish. So I was like, just thinking, thinking this time tomorrow, it's going to be, it's going to be finished. It's going to be all over. But yeah, it was, um, <laughs> it was hardcore. Yeah, good effort, mate. Good effort. Are you, um, are you fully recovered now? Um, just, I'm just suffering a little bit with the fatigue. Because I haven't really been able to sleep properly since, because my my body clock's all messed up now. You know, I think after after twenty four hours, you know, you can kind of, you know, twenty four hours or less, you can kind of cope with. But anything over that, your body clock gets thrown out because it doesn't know when you should be sleeping or when you when when you shouldn't be. But it's a bit I'm it's a bit weird at the minute because come five o'clock, I'm absolutely chinned, <laughs> and then by eight o'clock, I'm awake again. And it's like, oh, come on. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's the only thing I'm suffering a little bit now with is is fatigue. Are you back into wheelchair rugby now? No, it's it's a it's a bit of a funny one. Like with wheelchair rugby, I haven't been able to go to training quite well at all this season yet because I'm working so much. So, it's um, I played a couple of tournaments. So, been managed to sp find some time on the weekends to go and play some tournaments, but. Yeah, in the week is a bit of a nightmare to try and go off training. It's a violent sport, that. 
Yeah. I've watched it a few times. Yeah, I've it's never really not even, I've seen it on yeah, I've watched it on TV a few times. Flipping violent, <laughs> mate. You get some speed in them chairs. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. What's the rules? What's the rules? Because you just smash into each other, can't yeah, you? Yeah, so it's it's like murder ball. <laughs> it's um yeah. But you can't really call that anymore, so so they call it rugby instead. But it's more <laughs> it's more like a crossover between ice hockey and American football. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it, so, but what, what? So, what's different? How does it work scoring wise? Is it the same scoring as um, normal rugby? No. So it's just it's just like a goal. So you get you get a point for every time you you, you cross the line and and things like that. It's a very complicated sport, Why like it? with the rules and things. <coughs> so on. there's different. So like you have an over and back rule, for instance. So if you carry the ball over the halfway line, you can't bring it back over the halfway line. So it's a turnover then. So you've got forty seconds to score the goal but you've got to get out of your half within 12 seconds so and you've got to bounce every 10 it's it's a, it's quite a lot of information to take in while you're while you're getting I'm confused s- already yeah <laughs> you should have seen me on my first first session <laughs> i was like just going around in circles <laughs> yeah. Do you have to have a special wheelchair for that yeah yeah so um i was quite lucky i got um I got sponsored by Blesma, um, so they 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 paid um, for three quarters of the chair, and I and I stumped up the rest of it. Um, but the club had um, you 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 can use the club's chairs as well, um, but squaddies being squaddies, they love their own kit, and they you know so it was like yeah I can can have my own chair can I and they were like yeah yeah we just apply for a grant and stuff like that and I was like right where do I. <laughs> How many teams are there in South Wales? Um, in South Wales, I think there's now three, um, but with the the Ospreys who I play for, are main uh, are the main established team. Um, the others are just starting out. So um, there, there's two sides to wheelchair rugby. There's the fours and there's the fives. So the fours is more traditional um, Olympic level um, or Olympic rules then, um, and then you've got the fives and which is were developed from the more able-bodied so you've got to play in the fours you've got to have a problem with both legs and both hands um so you've got to have um, a disability that affects all four limbs basically um whereas the fives you can you know you can uh, you just have one bad limb or things like that so or you or you've got like um a brain injury but you can still function with all of your limbs so yeah, it's uh, it's a good sport. It's uh, like you say, it's brutal. Just you just cane your shoulders, <laughs> shoulders and upper back is just like by the by the time you've played a tournament, four game tournament, you you're done. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely because um, you just sweat. Ospreys do a shitload for, for military, don't they? They do a shitload. Of them. I didn't realise until last year. When I say a shitload, they do stuff for the military yeah. community, which is. More than what I know, other well, I'm aware of other people doing. Yeah, and it, the, <clears throat> they did. Um, they started the walk in rugby last year, didn't they? Because they got the community outreach team there, haven't they? Yeah. As I know, this obviously via Sean. Sean was probably in touch with them. They got the community outreach team there, and they started walk in rugby for for military veterans. Yeah. Through uh, like Dulles Valley, Swansea Valley, different, different, different around doing it at different clubs. And I didn't realize they had the uh, the wheelchair. Is that specifically for for? Is that for, the wheelchair rugby, that's for any woman with a disability. It's not just military, right? Yeah, it's oh, anybody. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a civvy team. Um, and they're, they're their own charity. So we're not... Oh. So we're, we're kind of affiliated with the Ospreys and they, uh, they allow us to, um, you know, like use their name and their logo and things like that. And we do a lot of um, integration with <coughs> Ospreys in the community. So um, I think they've just sponsored our new kit and everything like that. But I've... I haven't I haven't managed to get down to training at all this year, um, which is a shame because I used to be there like like a shot. But um, you know my work comes first, and obviously making time for my family as well. It's um, but I try and infill where I can. You know, if they're if they're short on a tournament and things, you go away for the weekend and play. So yeah, it's um, so it's. It's a it's a it's a it's a good thing to get back into you know obviously having a disability and things, you know a lot of people think oh that's it now I can't do anything, but it's not the case you know there's loads and loads and loads of stuff out there, 
you know, disability sport whales are or all over it. So, yeah. How did your family um, find the Surviving Hellman documentary? Yeah. You, you know, the, the missus with me, like, because she's obviously, we've been together since school, so she's been there from the off and... I think it was a bit a bit strange her watching it next to me because it's always been that separation. Um, although she's been through it, it's always been that separation. But um, she was all right. Um, it's the first time my kids have kids have kind of um, seen that side of me as well. So, How old are your kids? Um, my eldest is twelve. Um, the middle one is nine, and my youngest is is six. Yeah, so um, my eldest, y- y- you know, I kind of feel for a little bit because he's he's been through it all. You know, he's been he's been there through the ups and the downs and the deployments. And how old was he like when you um, got blown up then? So he was nine months old, six okay. months, nine months old. Um, but again, that kind of threw him into a whirlwind because obviously my mum had to look after him a lot. Y- you know, the missus was up and back to the hospital all the time and. Um, yeah, because we we had just been married. We'd probably been married about six months, if that. Um, so we just moved into our pad at you know at the Dale, and obviously when when I deployed, she went back home because she hadn't had a chance to meet anybody or or anything like that. So she went back home, or well, to and fro in from from the the pad to to her house, and when I got blown up kind of threw everything into a bit of a whirlwind really so my mum and her mum ended up looking after my well dav at the time you know my eldest now a lot and he was getting thrown from pillar to post so he didn't really settle very well um but yeah it was uh it's a bit of a whirlwind for him where did they record where did they record the interview with you was it the house no it was down at the hub um Oh. Uh, Forwardy's Lodge, yeah. So it was down there. So we did all the filming sort of in one day. Oh, that's good out of the way then. I did mine yeah. in the front front living room of my parents' place. Yeah. With my dad at the back. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a bit, yeah. Is a bit weird. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't know, <coughs> they, they probably the same with you, interviewed for a couple of, about, for a couple of hours. But they didn't use much of the footage, but there was yeah. stuff in there. I remember they were asking me questions. And, I, you know, my, d- my dad was part of the answer. I was talking about my old man, knowing he's out in the kitchen, drinking a brew, pretending he's not listening, but actually yeah. listening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How did you find that experience of, of doing the actual interview going through? Because he asked some pretty, like, cutting questions. And the other thing is, is when they interviewed us for that, so for people not aware, Steve and I were on a documentary called, Survi- it was called Surviving Helmand. BBC Wales commissioned it. Got released last week, so that would be Tuesday, the 9th of November, my yeah. mailman's birthday, funny enough. But it was recorded before the fall of Afghan, yeah. wasn't it? This is the thing. I remember when, that, when Afghan fell, I remember thinking, oh my God, what did I, have, I, have I given any answers that are going to make me look like an absolute moron in that, you know? You know yeah. have, I, have I said, Afghan level fall, the Taliban level, take, take, take it back. And I like, yeah. didn't. But uh, yeah, how did you find it yourself? I Yeah, so my... Um, my interview was done after the fall, funny enough. Oh, was it? Yeah. So, oh, right. Because okay, they, cause right. they'd done a, a, a pause for COVID and everything like that, you know, when they first started sort of filming. And um, I remember, I'm a, I'm a really positive guy. And I don't, I, I don't normally do things like that, you know, because I don't <coughs> know how things are going to be taken. You know, they can, sometimes they can turn what you've said as a positive and turn it right around into a negative. So I was really, really dubious. And I remember, um, is it Steve Humphreys, the the producer? I remember sitting him down and saying, "Listen, I'm not doing the interview if this if this is how it's going to come out because like, and it was a big thing for me as well. So I'd sent a message out to a few of the lads saying, "Listen, you know, this isn't just my story; it's your story as well. Um, what do you think about me doing the documentary?" And they were like, I, "You know, I was expecting, uh, you know, but it wasn't. It was all positive." You know, they said, yeah, do it, you know, because this needs to be talked about. So, yeah, I did, I did it. And I remember it was it was a bit of a strange experience, really, because um, I've, I've I've told my story to like schools and things like that, because I did a course through Blessma, um, like public speaking. But it was a bit more intimate, this one, um, you know, sitting there with a camera in front of your face, you know, and 
it's weird how they, they, they extract some of the emotions out of you. Do you know what I mean? When they ask a certain question and you're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, right, okay, how do I answer this? You know, and you're trying to be conservative a little bit as well. You know, we're not, not trying to give too much away, but, but also trying to have your own agenda of being positive and, you know, saying, so it was a bit of a, it's a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. And then when they, when they said, oh, is it, is it all right if we come and film your kids? And I was like, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, um, the overall experience was good. I quite enjoyed it, you know, and I've, to be honest with you, I felt like a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Oh, after. really? Why yeah. is that? I don't know. It's just because, you know, this program is potentially is going to be seen, you know, by a few hundred thousand or a couple of million or, you know, we didn't know at the time. So it's like, right, okay, you know, this is going to be spoken about and a lot of the people that live around the area as well, you know, a lot, a lot of people that live around me aren't ex-military or, or things like that. And th they've got this perception of what, what happened to you. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, right, okay, they, they can watch it and they can get, they can get the proper information. So, um, yeah, I did that. And then obviously six weeks later I did my event and things. So by the, by the time the documentary came out, I was like, whoa, just, just felt like, you know, 10 stone lighter. It was a, it was quite a good feeling. Has it been received well in the local community? Have they said, have they, anyone said anything to you? No, it's been, it's been received really well, you, you know, and I think, um, a lot of people didn't realize actually the severity of, of what happened, if you know what I mean? So, you know, I like <coughs> it was touch and go whether I would survive basically, you know, in that, in that, in, in that instance. And a lot of people didn't know that. You know, they think, oh, okay, he's he, he's walking around now. He must, he must, it mustn't have been that bad. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, initially, I remember um, at that time, the medic, he's a he's a friend, and um, one of my one of my good mates, John, who was who was dealing with me, like he's seen the caption of the the picture on the documentary, of um, of those who were working on me, and I remember at one stage the, the medic looked up at, and he went. Oh God! Yeah, and I remember him looking at that. <laughs> Look, I was just like, "Oh, brilliant!" <laughs> like pulling that faces in, I yeah, don't know, save, save this guy. Yeah. But you're not conscious. But did I remember, remember remembering this wrong? You were conscious initially, weren't you, when you got through blown the, up through the whole thing? Yeah, and, and yet you were on death door yeah. while being conscious. Yeah, that's not a usual thing, is it? No. Talk about that, mate. Yeah, that is so wild. So I if remember. You don't mind. You yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I remember the detonation of the explosion. What were you in, Scimitar? Uh, Jackal. Jackal. Oh, yeah. that's right, yeah, Jackal. Yeah, yeah so uh, it, it was a weird experience. Just remember the Jackal, like, lifting off the floor and everything went into slow motion. Um, but for some reason, I got, like, swept off my feet rather than getting launched out. Where, what position were you in, Jackal? Um, I was top cover. Okay. Yeah, so, and I was a 60 mil guy as well. So I had 60 mil, I had four 60 mil HE bombs underneath me as well. <laughs> so. Um, Did they go off? N well, they couldn't find them after. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was. Um, so I remember the whole thing flying through the air, but it was rotating at the same time. Um, and then felt a thud when it landed, and I just remember, like, as as the smoke was clearing, I could just smell the kerosene and diesel all over me, because uh, the auxiliary tank went up, the main tank went up, the um, the jerry cans on the side went up. So there's just massive amounts of, of fuel everywhere. And I would just see my legs sticking out of this hole that this IED's created. You know, it's taken half the vehicle, you, you know, where the top cover. If It was funny because I was facing the other way. Backwards. Yeah, so I was, so where the where the chunk is missing out of the, the side of the wagon, I was, I was stood above that, but I traversed and started, because there was a guy on a motorbike, I remember him coming down off the high ground. So we traversed to track him and um, literally detonated. So um, if I was stood like literally like 30 seconds, I would have been, I would have been brown bread like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been here. But um, yeah, so I remember like thinking, and I remember shouting, I was trying to shout over, the, over my PRR, you know, to the, um, to the vehicle in front, but it was just nothing, I could, it was just getting static. Oh, after you'd been blown up? Yeah. So um, I remember pulling myself out of the wagon 
Um, when did you realize that you you feel you like your leg was fucked, or um, like you were fucked, like properly fucked? Because uh, obviously it wasn't just your leg. You were yeah. So 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 basically, I I crawled out, crawled out backwards, stood up, and my lid fell off. And I was like, oh, right, okay, because the chin strap had gone. So I was like, oh, fucking, I was like crap, and I could hear my driver, but I couldn't hear anything at the minute. So I, I, as I looked over, I could see I could see my driver screaming, and I was like. You couldn't hear him. But I couldn't hear him. But uh, but then as I was looking at his mouth, it was like somebody was turning up the telly. <laughs> and then I so I, I went over to him and um and and did his and did his seatbelt and got got him into a sort of position. And then I looked up and I couldn't see my commander. I was like, Oh, what did you crawl over? No, I walked. I walked over to him, and then I walked over to my commander then because I found he, he was he was a bit a bit further away from the vehicle because he had been launched out like kind of woke him up and then i just remember like stumbling backwards and just like my head just started spinning and i was like Fucking hell, what's going on here and then ended up on my on my sort of ass and then I, w- I remember being on my sort of elbows and then the guy sort of getting to me going fuck you're all right you're all right all i felt was a little bit of a dead leg you know like some of these like hit you in the side of the leg or, or something like that so i didn't didn't really feel it and then my mate john got to me and he started putting a ffd around my head I'm like fighting him. I'm like, fuck, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you know, you, he goes, oh, you got a head injury. I was like, no, I haven't. So basically, as I got swept off, the 50 cal had hit my body armor plate. And then um, it hit my head. So it fractured my eye socket. And the whole part of my eyebrow was all open. And um, yeah, because I thought it was just diesel in my eyes and stuff. But it wasn't, it was blood. And I was trying to like wipe it out of the way. <laughs> So we started doing that, and then the medic got to me, and he he, he kind of like looked down the side of my um, down the side of my leg. And remember the old hemp con? Yeah, hemp con, yeah. Oh yeah. my god! What? He pulled pulled a pack of that out, shoved it straight in my leg. Ah, oh, the pain then hit me, and I was like, "Fucking, what are you doing?" <laughs> I was like, "Get off me!" Like that, and I said, oh, "How bad is the leg?" And he, all he did, right, he pulled his hand out and he showed me his glove, like this. And he went, it's like that. Well, no, it's, like it's as deep, deep as, as that. It's his, 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 his hand. hand, yeah. Jesus. And I was like, up to your wrist, I was up like, to his wrist. Yeah, I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting there like that and um, I started going a bit woozy and feeling a bit funny and I, re- I remember looking at John again. I was like, John, give me a fag. Like that. And he was like, Steve, he goes, you, you're covered in diesel and fuel and kerosene. I was like, give me a fucking fag. <laughs> And the medic looked at him and he was like, give him a fag. <laughs> <laughs> so he walks off and he, and he, and he, and he lights a fag. But he lights two. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? He goes, oh, one's for me. <laughs> so, he, you, you know, and you've got to remember as well, like, you know, so my, my driver was trapped as well. So he, um, part of the armoured plate of the, um, of the footwell of the jackal had lifted and landed on his foot. Oh. So it trapped him in the vehicle. So the, the boys are frantically trying to get him out. What position was the vehicle? Was it on its, was on out, its side? It's on its side, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So all, all this is happening, and I just remember, like, I could feel my body shutting down. It was weird. I could feel like all the blood draining from my head. It was going, it was going funny. Like my arms it's, it's kind of stopped working properly. Everything was trying to go into the core, and um, that's the point then where the the medic looked at looked at my mate, and he was just like, you know. I hope the bird's going to be here soon. Like, um, where were you? Where were you in in uh, Helmand? So we were in Nadi Ali. Um, we were only about 40, 50 kilometers outside of Bastion. Um, Whereabouts in Nadi Ali were? You? Uh, well, we were heading. We were heading towards Wahid. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Wahid, yeah so yeah. we we were heading towards Wahid, um, and yeah, we were about. Well, I don't know. We we're probably about five, ten kilometers from Wahid at the time. Yeah, and it was it was a. So we, we, we didn't know what was happening because we had compounds left and right of us at this point. So we were like, oh. and we were, we, we were eight vehicle convoy plus um, two A&A wagons as well. So we were, we were center of mass basically. Uh, so our course line was split. Um, but luckily, because we were quite close to Bastion, from point of explosion to being on the operating table, 45 minutes. Yeah. Rapid. Yeah, it was quick. It was quick. So um, when I, it, it was another weird experience. I remember like losing consciousness on the um, 
on the mert on the way back in twice. And the second time I woke up with um, pressure on my chest. So basically my heart, on the machines, like my heart stopped and they were about to start CPR and I, I came round again. Jesus. Which was a, which was a, a surreal experience. And they're, they're, they're wheeling so me. So when in. you passed out the second time, you, you fucking died. Yeah, technically, yeah. So, um, and then just came round. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it's, it's mad. I, <sighs> I, I couldn't really comprehend it. I was like, oh no, they they were just doing it as a precaution. Why did your body decide to kick back in? Why? Why is that? No, like, I, <laughs> why yeah. your brain goes so not I, now, I, not this time? Yeah. So like I like I said in the documentary, I had a photo of my, um, so I made John sort of go in the back of my body armor. And I said, like, there's a photo in there um, of my of my wife and baby, and uh, she he pulled it out of me, and I didn't let go of that until I got put to sleep. Yeah, which was it was, uh, and that's the first time I've told anybody that. <laughs> what that you didn't let go of it? Yeah, so first time like on the documentary, nobody else knew that. Not even not even my wife about the photo. Yeah. So um, and did did your wife not realise that until she actually watched it? I told her because I was looking for this photo. <laughs> I knew one of us had it, so I was like, "Oh, I've I've said this in 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 the documentary. <laughs> Have you got this photo?" <laughs> and she was like, oh, "I think so." And then we, we we found it amongst all the other photos. So, yeah, I remember them wheeling me into the That's in brownie points, that mate. Yeah, That's brownie points for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she wasn't happy about it going on live telly or the photo. <laughs> So I remember them wheel- wheeling me into the roll three. Um, obviously, we had the RAF firemen taking the stretches in and stuff like that. And this this American doctor came running out. And he was like, have you had any pain relief? And I was like, no, because I've got a head injury. And he just stuck a needle straight into my neck. Oh or ketamine. <laughs> like that. So by this point now, I'm off my nut. And they're putting me into the CT scanner, talking about hallucinating. I was going mad then, eh? It was like, it was like flipping, get me out of here. <laughs> Literally, because I was covered head to toe in diesel and f- and kerosene, they had to flip and wash me down before going into theatre. So I had my initial wash down, and by this point, like I'm a, I'm in an absolute clip. You know, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I've got blood, but blood being attached to me. I've got fluids and all sorts. So yeah, so the bed bath for me is. She's like, we're we're gonna cut the rest of your clothes off you. Is that all right? And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. what was the extent of your injuries um so i had um so obviously a severe shrapnel wound to my right thigh um it's weird i didn't break a bone uh, apart from my eye socket so the piece of shrapnel had gone in missed the femoral artery but hit the other two main highways and the medic said that when it when when his hand was in there he could just feel it hitting hitting his hand what the, the blood uh, the, the oh, really? like, so he was like <laughs> pumping so, out yeah so you know how big the pieces of hemcom are yeah i had two and a half of them in in the leg and it was still like not not sufficient enough so um and he couldn't put any more in because it would have caused extensive damage because obviously it is thermal so yeah we did that and um literally i woke up seven hours later from theater yeah my driver, my driver, Jock, like he, 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 I think he was convinced that I wouldn't make it. So um, remember, I remember them wheeling me sort of out, and he's, he's, he's like right there. <laughs> so they, they, they brought me out, and they didn't, they didn't put me in the, um, in the coma straight away. Um, so they, they brought me out, they brought me back to the bedside, and um, you know the banter started then. You know, being at the bedside, I'd like six different bags of things hanging around me you know off my head on pain relief and um jock was like oh you coming for a fag <laughs> i was like well I'm, I'm 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 like tied to the bed so um then the padre turned up and i was like oh this is bad news oh, no. <laughs> how did that go it was all right so we, oh my we God. Got, what did he say <laughs> yeah he was like um so they've they've asked if um you want to ring home and tell and tell everybody that you've been injured, or do you want me to do it? And I was like, "Well, if if the padre rings back, they're going to think I've died, so I'll I'll do it while you're off your tits." Yeah. yeah. So they give they give me the sat phone, and I'm, uh, I remember ringing my missus first, and she just ends up going into hysterics before I've even said anything. I said, um, "I've been blown up," and that was it. Couldn't get any sense out of her then, so I hung up. <laughs> 
And then I ring my mum and she does the same. And then I hung up and I was just like, you know, I can't get any sense out of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I thought I was tripping by this point. I was like, what's going on? So did that. And um, my dad was w- worked, worked for the ambulance. So he's an ambulance man. So he's, he, this is a story from him. He's going down the motorway to the hospital. Gets a phone call. On a job. Yeah, yeah. gets a phone call from, from obviously from my mum. So he rings control. Control have got a car waiting for him at the hospital to bring him back. And they said, we'll give you blue lights all the way to, all the way to Sally Oak. And he's like, no, he goes, I've got to go and pick up my daughter-in-law and things like that. So while well, they're back home doing that, by this point now, Jock has managed to get me into a wheelchair. <laughs> in, but were you in Bastion? In Bastion, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's managed to get me in a wheelchair, although the nurses have told him not to. He's got me into a wheelchair and he's piled all of these <laughs> all of these bags of things on top of me. And I'm like, so he's and he's convinced the padre. So how we've got fags is the padre's <laughs> gone to the naffy and bought a load of fags. <laughs> this is brilliant. So uh, so to get to the smoking area in, in the in the hospital, you have to go down this wooden ramp. So I like I'm in shit state. My head's all swollen because I've got you know, head injury and that as well. How long after the explosion's this? Um, about the same day yeah about nine hours <laughs> <laughs> get to that smoke pit go for a yeah. bind yeah. <laughs> what's the worst that can happen so he turns me into the smoking area and the nurse is there standing staring at him like how have you managed to get him into the By the, I've got a bandage right my wound is still open because they won't close in Bastion because oh of infection my God. and I'm sitting there like that alright <laughs> so I have the fag and my blood pressure plummets so they're like oh, so they wheel me back up and that they get me on the flight then by this point. So the, the reason that we went for a fag is because the um, Aeromed was coming to fly us back to the UK. So we have to get that one in there quickly because I didn't know when I was going to have a fag neck. So we, we, we did that and uh, <laughs> my blood pressure dropped that low then. They put me in a medical coma then on the flight um, and then woke me up. Then How did they tell you they were going to do that? Did they, did they tell you they're going to put you in a car? Yeah. So they, they or they just like yeah, spring it on you? Yeah, just just wait for him to pass out. Yeah. Then. <laughs> uh, yeah, what happened there? No, so my blood pressure was dropping on the flight. Um, <coughs> Why was it dropping, do you know? Just because I'd lost so much <coughs> blood on the ground. Um, so it was dropping and because of altitude and everything like that, it was really messing with, with my vitals. So um, they made the call then to to sort of put me to sleep, which was good because I don't... I, you, you know... On an aeromed, they like stack you up on stretchers, so you're like the next. I was like one from the top, so there was another stretcher above me, and it was like you probably had about that much room. <laughs> it was yeah, like a stack of biffs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know they yeah. did that. Yeah. How many of you are on there? Um, a tristar, you're on something like that. No, we're on a C17. Oh, oh, yeah. right, okay. So this is how my luck runs, right? <laughs> so by this point now. Just before they put me into this medical induced coma, hydraulics go on the flight. <laughs> so they said we we normally land in Birmingham, but we're gonna have to land in Bryce. I was like, right, okay, why? The hydraulics are gone on the plane. <laughs> I was like, brilliant. So we, they said we've either got enough hydraulics to get the landing gear down, or or break. So we're gonna have to pull the landing gear down by manually and use the hydraulics to break. I was like, brilliant. <laughs> so I've just been blown up. <laughs> I'm potentially going to be in, a, in an aeroplane crash. <laughs> so I was like, oh, just... And then they made the call to put me to sleep, so I was, like, happy with that. So, um, yeah. But you know what, though? It, it was a surreal experience. It was... But like I was saying, when we were talking to the patrons, it was like... As in on the pre podcast, the yeah. people yeah. listening, yeah. Yeah. So um everybody needed to be where they were. And it was it was it was just smooth. What do you mean? So like with our training and everything, obviously we drill, you know, getting blown up and you know but everybody was where they were supposed to be and it was it was commanded well, it was everything was right. And I've got no doubt if we'd been opened up by the Taliban as well at the same time, it would have been dealt with. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, I've got to, say, I've got to give a shout out to the boys for that because, they, you know, it was... Um, and there were secondaries on the ground as well. So my commander landed ne- nearly on top of a secondary. 
Yeah. So he he was a lucky. But the guys in the in the instinct, like you you know, if it was it was a weird one because if they hadn't reacted the way they did and got to me quickly, I probably would have died. But they they put their life on the line basically without having to clear up to us properly. You know, so they just swung swung the next the closest wagon round to get to us. And they did and you know, that's that's how I'm here today. So, you know, cheers guy. Cheers, lads. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, you have got that unusual perspective of having been conscious for, for most of it. The human body's amazing, isn't it? Oh. You get blown up like that and then your adrenaline is doing such a mega job that you're able to walk yourself over to the other guys. Yeah. Get them like try and get them squared away before then the adrenaline starts being off and then you yeah. spank in. But still don't realise you're fucked. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, arguing with the medic. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. What was, what was and then you're trying to look then. But it's it's funny, like I remember I was wearing um uh, North Face seven hundred uh, tog jacket. It was a, one of my proudest possessions. It cost me like 250 quid, this jacket did. And being, be, they call me a Cardi because I'm from Cardigan and tight with my money, West Whalian, see? <laughs> so um, I'm like, I'm, I'm adamant now. I'm like, do not cut this jacket off me. <laughs> and they're like, well, we got to check. I said, don't cut the jacket off me. I said, you can cut the body armor off, but don't cut the jacket. In all fairness, they, they, they took, they, they undid it and everything like that. And I was still wearing it when I was rolled into the hospital. So I was like, right, okay. So they, they, they did that. I, in Birmingham then, when I got released from hospital, I went to collect all my items that had come back with me from Afghan. And the jacket's still there. Although it's humming of diesel, it's, it's still in a carrier bag, uncut. My dad hung it in a shed. <laughs> and it's still there now. Is it? <laughs> Shrapnel everywhere in it. <laughs> it's clean off. Yeah. Yeah, so like with the injuries and that, obviously I had the severe um, shrapnel wound to my right leg and I had a severe shrapnel wound to my head. Um, I've got permanent damage to my head as well. Um, I've severed two, two vital nerves just in the eye socket. Um, so I've got no feeling here, sensory-wise, of the temple, yeah, and, and, and you know, to the base. But um, if I hit it or anything, flipping out, it drops me nearly. Yeah. Why is that? Just because of like the... Um, like there's like a neuroma, which is like um, like a lump of scar tissue over the top of the end of the nerve. Um, but it just sent because the nerve comes out of here, goes all the way up, and then goes into the back of the head, back of the skull. So um, yeah, that's uh, sensitive. But I've had I've already had one operation to try and try and rectify it or try and heal it. But I've got to have another one now, you know, coming up soon. To a nerve graft, to a, a nerve from my hand into my head. So. Huh. Yeah. Really? Technology, yeah. I didn't know they could do that. Yeah, nerve graft. Yeah. You put much graft anything. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. That's fucking mad. And I was lucky because of the um, I've got very little scar in there. That's because there was facial surgeons in in Bastion at the time. So while while they were dealing with my leg, these surgeons came in and made sure like th they were plastic surgeons. So you know, I'd um didn't do anything else with the looks, but <laughs> yeah, they they proper squared me away. So, were you in? Um, what was Salio like? Was Salio like on that ward? Were you, was there uh, were the other guys around you or people around you? Might have been girls in there. Compass Madness. Or yeah, yeah. Was it depressing in there or what? Was it? How did you find it? Oh, it's a weird, weird one. It was because on my so I so when they pull you out of intensive care, they put you on to. Um, Ward 1 or Ward A or Bay 1 or Bay A, I can't remember the name. Um, I was the only one in there with all my limbs because it was during that, it was during the, like a, the bloodiest time in Afghan. So I was the only one on that, on that bay with what, all my limbs. What year limbs. was it? What year? Uh, 2010. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a bit, I felt like a bit of a fraud because I'm lying there with all my limbs and I'm like looking around me and like, you know, there's, guy next to me with three limbs missing there's a guy opposite me with both his legs missing another guy sitting opposite both his legs are blind i'm like flipping out but they were the, the two surgeons were arguing whether they were going to take my leg off or not you know so it was that damage so yeah it was uh <laughs> it was a bit of a weird one and then obviously as you get better that you move down in bays then so you you then you move into like a bay with 
guys that have like got a broken back or you know broken their legs or missing a finger or something like that um or been shot and then eventually then when you're ready then you're you're discharged um yeah so it's uh yeah it's a weird one it's uh It's quite gruesome. It's quite horrific. In what way? Just to look around and see see guys in that sort of mess. It's um, I remember like my my mum, missus, and dad. Bearing in mind, you know, my dad had worked for the ambulance service for nearly twenty five years at this point. You know, so he's seen some pretty horrendous stuff. But they briefed him saying, you know, just brace yourself when you walk in. And there's a distinct smell as well. You know, of like almost like infection. Oh, so it's yeah. yeah, you and it's it's on you all the time, and you can't can't really escape it. But um, yeah, it was uh, it's an experience. Mm. When did they? Uh, how did was the decision made to take your leg? When did you lose the leg then? Um, I forgot you didn't lose it immediately. Yeah, so 2016, I lost a leg, um, but I'd had. You so had constant dramas over with it, did you? Yeah, so I'd, I'd, in, in total, before losing the leg, I had 23 operations on it. Um, but bearing in mind now, so I'd recovered in Headley Court, I'd been in Headley Court and, d- and did all of that, and I was given the choice. The, the documentary kind of like skipped over it a little bit, didn't really <coughs> say what actually happened. So I did actually redeploy. Um, oh, right. Yeah, so I, I got fit again and redeployed um, back on Herrick 16. Deployed there and... Um, what year was that? Uh, 2012. Um, so 18 months later, pretty much. I bet you, I bet your family was chuffed with that one. Oh yeah, I Jesus. went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> 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 yeah. I remember sitting there saying like, um, "I'm redeploying back to Afghan," and they were like, "What?" And then they ended up <laughs> big family argument, and I was like, "Well, it's my decision, so you know, you can kick off at each other all you want. I'm going." Do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, so I decided to do that. It was either that or. or or just get medically discharged, and I wasn't ready. Do you know what I mean? So I, I fought, you know, tooth and nail to, to, to get fit again, um, which I did. I was, I was, ba- I banged in the CFT in an hour thirty-five. <laughs> so I was like, ah, right, I'm ready. <laughs> but it was a bad move. It, w- I wasn't, I wasn't physically ready. Y- you know, my leg wasn't nowhere near strong enough. Um, so we deployed on Herrick sixteen, we were up, up a Gresh Valley. Um, Moved into a, a new OP that was established there, and then I, I think four or five months, um, ended up going on R and R. And as I was coming back off R and R, my leg just went, you know. And I remember getting off the the heli to, re- to go back into the OP, and I looked down, and my my leg was just twice the size of the other one. I was like, shit, that's not good. So I ended up doing an about turn, getting back on the heli, <laughs> going back to um, Bastion where they did an ultrasound and one of the um, the stents that they'd put in to repair the artery I'd, was leaking and it'd come undone basically what's a stent so it's just it's just um uh, like a sheathing to to repair the artery like a protective coat okay and to hold it open so that started leaking and and things like that so um I was bleeding out again effectively so back to the UK more operations and at that point then I knew like you know my career was over do you know what I mean so, um, yeah, started the ball rolling with that. Uh, that was 2013. Um, and then I got better again and ended up doing CP in Iraq. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on the, um, I was on the FCO contract over there, British embassy. So in did, Baghdad. Yeah. So did that, did that for a bit along, along and we doing different jobs in London and, and things like that. Um, and then enough got enough. It, it finally caught up with me because I kept always putting myself in dangerous situations. Anywhere I'd go, it'd be it'd be dangerous. So um, yeah, so I I remember just sitting there going, right, you've got to pull the plug on this now. You know, you've got to start putting your family first. You know, they've backed you up all of these years. Now you've got to start returning the favour. So um, and I knew deep down my leg wasn't going to hold up forever. So yeah. And then I remember, when was it now? August 2016. I was sitting at home, legs up on the on the coffee table, and just felt this massive pain shoot up from my from my scar. 
straight up into my body. From straight your scar? Yeah, yeah, from my leg. And straight up into my chest. I thought I'd had a blood clot. that had gone, gone straight to my lung because I couldn't breathe. I was like, fucking... Mrs. was out. I had to ring the ambulance myself. Ambulance turned up and they were like, like looked at the leg and they were like, shit, you've got to go to the hospital. Took me straight to Morriston Hospital then. Um, they were convinced it was a blood clot. Did a scan and they were like, no, you're all right. <laughs> I was like, there's something wrong. So after two in and fro in and, and another operation, um, they found out that basically two two nerves had touched each other, and um, in the leg. Yeah, two nerves had touched each other and effectively short circuited and killed the leg. So it's um, weird, like yeah. So sort of my foot, my foot just like it was like somebody had turned it off and my foot just went flop like that and I couldn't feel it, couldn't couldn't do anything with it. So um, and the pain was horrendous, like all the time. It got to the point where I was on so much pain relief that the anaesthetist, before they took my leg off, thought I was lying. I was like, I'm not lying. This is how much I'm on. And he was like, he goes, you shouldn't even be standing on this much. Medication, you mean? Yeah. So gabapentin with a, was a nerve pain tablet. I was on 4,600 milligrams of that a day. Like that. And they were just like, <laughs> flipping out. So um, I went to see my surgeon. The surgeon in Morriston had refused to take it off. Uh, On what grounds? Why? He said, "Oh, it's it's a healthy limb," and I was like, "Are we looking at the same limb? Because it was blue, and it was getting mottled." Yeah. So, um, because it was not very good blood blood flow to the foot, it eventually gangrene would have set in. So, um, I overruled him, and I went to back to my surgeon in Salisbury, and I said, "Listen, we've done. He's done eighty percent of my operations." And I said, "Listen, I want my leg off." I go, I've already spoke to my family, I've already spoke to people, you know, that matter. And they've all come to the same agreement. And uh, he goes, I agree with you. When should we do it? And I was like, oh, what? no no arguing. <laughs> you know, like, like I don't have to like fight my case. And he was like, no. He's like, when do you want to do it? So I was like, well, as soon as, as, soon as you can. Six weeks later, I was on the, I was on the slab having, uh, having my leg off. And I, yeah, I haven't really looked back since. Yeah, it's been uh, been a bit of a journey, but um, yeah, like I said though, I do it all over again. I do all that over again because it's it's molded me to like where I am now. Um, but like I I use myself as um, a tool in effect where I've got to be a good role model to the people around me, you know. Because now, whether we like it or not. The guys who have lost limbs out in Afghan and, and you know, have been severely injured. We're, we're role models now to the next generation of guys coming through, you know, saying like you can you can do things even when you when when you are fucked, basically. So, um and that's been kind of like my driving force, you know, to to, to always be a better person. That's a good fucking point that is, you know. Yeah. On the last podcast I was talking to um Guy called Richard Sharp, yeah, uh, ex boot neck officer, really good guy. And we were discussing, we were discussing, you know, how uh, the sort of victim mentality or uh, of of you know some aspects of the military veteran community and and um, you know the way pe how people conduct themselves, especially online. And yeah. you raised a really good point there. You know, it's like uh, people flipping kick off anything these days and you get a lot of people think they're owed everything in the world because they did this out of the other or because of this injury or that illness or whatever and you made a good point mate yeah it's like role, your role models not only the people around you now like family for example yeah. the obvious ones and kids and all that yeah. but it's the next generation of soldier sailors and yeah. airmen it's a really good point yeah I, I mean you should if I can think of you know people now I think who are prominent ex-military online or in the news or whatever and you think, what is a a young potential recruit thinking when they look at that person? Yeah, is, is that the is that the kind of person you want as a role model, or is it not? Yeah. You know, yeah. So really good point. I hadn't I hadn't thought of before. Mm. And like you, you know, military guys, we all, we always want to push ourselves, don't we? Do you know what I mean? You know, or or the majority of us do. You know, you get a lot of guys that would rather not do it, but. You know, I don't know how much more I've got left in me. Do you know what I mean? Physically, you know, mentally, I'll go forever. But 
physically i've got to be realistic like because you know from from my injuries i damaged every vertebrae in my back when i got blown up and i didn't find that out till two years ago oh really um, yeah. so there was more to it what did you do with your back then yeah so um t11 and 9 are um off they've been slipped basically um and i've got have you heard of schwartz nodes they're like little um uh, what do you call them? Like like ulcer, not ulcers, um, like cysts yeah. on each ver- on each disc, all the way from from my coccyx up to up to C one. Yeah, so it's um, you know I've got that to contend with. Um, I need a knee re- knee and hip replacement because obviously on the good side. On the good side, yeah. Um, you know, I probably I probably get another five years out of my knee and my hip until yeah. I'm, I'm until I'm in clip. Not if I keep smashing, flipping four hundred laps around this running track, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe maybe two and a half years then. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a you know it's just something that you know my personal preference is something that I want to do to you know show others that it can be done. You know I mean, it doesn't matter. You, you, you know, you'll always find find something to do. You know whether it's mentally or physically. So um, yeah, that's why like four months after the amputation, I'd been walking about six weeks, three weeks fully. Um, I did a twenty-six mile sponsored walk. Yeah, which was horrendous. Um, physically, it wasn't wasn't a great thing to do. Mentally, it was the hundred percent right thing to do. So um, yeah, I did that. And it by the end, but so I had only st- I had only aimed to do one mile. You know, as a, as a new amputee, a mile is quite a quite a big feat. So excuse the pun, um, but <laughs> so I did I did the um, I did the first mile, did the second mile, and I thought oh I feel all right yeah. Did the fifth mile, thinking all right it's starting to hurt a little bit now. I got to mile ten and I was like fucking I'm I'm in bits here but I'm committed now. I've got the bug. I've got to finish. Got to yeah, and every oh, it was horrendous. I, and, and I'd broken skin by this point on my stump, and I was, you know like where you get that blister, and you feel it go, and you're like oh yeah, shit, the skin's just gonna peel off now. And I I got to mile twenty, and there's a photo in the documentary of me leaning on the misses like that with my head down, like that. I, I wanted to uh, throw the towel in, so obviously you know about the jack wagon. <laughs> So we pulled into a lay-by, and we're at mile 20 this is now, so it's quite a big stop. And uh, I was leaning against the hedge before I was leaning on on the missus, and the minibus turned up. And, like, two people turned around to me. It was like, oh, you can get on the minibus now. You know, you, look, you've you've done amazing. Like, and I'm, all that's going through my head is I am never getting on that jack wagon. I'm not doing it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, just for my, my personal sanity. Like, I'll never forgive myself. So... <laughs> I said, right, if I can take two more steps, I'm not stopping. Uh, first step, oh, I was agony. Second step, it was probably worse than the first one, but I'd done two steps, so in my head, I was like, right, I've got, I've got to go. So, um, yeah, I ended up walking six miles without stopping. And that was, that was probably until the 400 for 457, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Yeah, it looked like somebody had poured a kettle over my stump. For the end, yeah. The value of the value of putting yourself through mental or physical hardship regularly, at whatever level, cannot be un, like it cannot be overstated. It just cannot be. Um, no, it's, like, uh, it's just an. It, it's something I've only really discovered the value. I think regularly, small so really discovered the value of over the last couple of years, and it and when I say discovered the value of it, the value of it is that you you are proving value to yourself yeah you're proving yourself to be valuable because you you're willing to you're willing to endure hardship out of your own choice yeah out of your own choice you're 400 laps you're 26 miles yeah. out of your own choice yeah and so it, uh, what you get from that you get confidence you get a sense of achievement you get a sense of value you get you know you you're being a role model yeah like you're saying there to people you're showing people that things you can achieve stuff, even with people who have, have the most difficult of circumstances. Yeah, and uh, it, 
like I was saying earlier, like if I've got to do something like that, this sort of every year or every couple of years, just to hit the reset button, just so I so I I ground myself. So I when I go through these journeys and when I go through like the, the like the the mental robustness and the resilience and stuff like that, it just I just remind myself of who I am and why am I why why I'm doing it and you know what. What do I want to give back to somebody? You know, somebody watching me do something like that. What are they going to get out of it? You know, I've already proven to myself that I can I can push myself that hard. But is it, what is it showing other people? You know, if you've got somebody there that's really struggling, even if it's struggling mentally or physically, or got a disability, they see something like that, then they can they can go well. If he can do it, then I can do it, or I can do something. So maybe next time I do something, they'll come and support me. You know, even if it's for one lap, or you know, even if it's for you, you know, just to just say hi. Um, I, I've come to come to cheer you on. You know, so that's that's a big part of why um why I do it. So yeah, it's um it's been a it's been a hell of a journey. Yeah, I've done about four hundred charity miles now since being an amputee. Um, and I've pro uh, you know I've got much more left in me me yet uh, i've got to have a break now <laughs> i've been told by everybody right you've got to slow down and have a break <laughs> you know but um but yeah we're just trying to look look to the future see what see what's sort of going on um with, with that but um i just i kind of like draw my past a lot um with regards to like how i want to be treated but my my dad passed away in April last year, and he um, he always had this saying: treat people like you want to be treated, you know. And that was one of his, and he and he used to say it in Welsh. You know, I can't repeat it because it's because um, I don't really speak Welsh. But he used to say it in such a way where it was like flipping out. It really hit home, you know. Or he said, if you don't, um, if you can't do somebody a good one, don't do them a bad one, you know. And that that really sits with me, you know. Um, that's a good saying yeah I've never heard that before yeah and he used to he used to combine the two sayings in Welsh and it was this phrase and nobody can remember it <laughs> but it but it was so powerful when he when he spoke even um, he, he spoke once and the, the, there was an MP in earshot and he was like whoa can, can, can you repeat that <laughs> and he said it and he's like oh, he goes I'm going to use that <laughs> that was funny but yeah so he was um and I kind of like always wanted to be like him, not physically be like him, but have his same emulate him. Yeah, you know. And um, uh, funny the other day, somebody said, "He goes, you're just like your dad," which is like, oh, right, okay, I've, I've done something right then, you know, because he was well respected, well, y you know, looked up on, like, so, um, yeah. Cause he uh, he saved my life more than more than once. Yeah, sounds like a good man. Yeah. Um, tell me, uh, we've got a few minutes left, right? Yeah. Tell me about Woody's Lodge. So, where what do they do? Where are they doing it? So Woody's Lodge is um, a social hub for veterans and emergency services and their families. So we support. Um, oh, for emergency services as well. Yeah, I didn't realise that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we. Um, we look after emergency services um, and their families, which is, uh, you know, we find it's it works the same. You know, veterans, emergency services, we kind of cut from the same cloth. You know, we we join up to help. We you know and and to make a difference and yeah. So we we the bond is there. So how we help is, um, like I said, we're a social hub where veterans can get together and be around like-minded people. Um, and uh, we we also have support officers as well, and that can deal with benefits, pension inquiries, um, housing, and things like that. But we're we we class ourselves as a signposting charity, so we work closely with different organisations, different charities, local authorities, to get the help that the veteran needs. So it's a one-stop shop basically. Um, so they only have to tell their story once, and we can then get the support that they need. Because it can be, you know, frustrating or, you know, um, detrimental to a veteran if he has to say a story over and over again if he doesn't doesn't want to. 
so or she doesn't want to so um yeah that's that's kind of what we're, so we're based across the whole of wales right now so we've got um our main head office and our hub is in barry which is based on the amelia trust farm um then we've got um western mid wales where i'm the project manager for the area um we're based in keridigion um Flanders Hill, um and we've got 11 acre small hold in there as well and then north wales then the main hub there is colman bay um but then there's 12 satellite sessions that that run there throughout the month every month so you know the likes of like rill wrexham conway um you know all the all the main locations in in North Wales. I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but um, and that's and that's you know basically what we do. Um, and uh, we're quite unique as well because we support the families, so we we run days and that for the families. So like um, we have one for um, like a, a packed lunch day every we- uh, every other Wednesday, um, which is um, partners um, and carers and children so they can come and um have a have a lunch and things like that away from their veteran or you know or their, their spouse basically um and they can come and enjoy sort of a bit of free time away from them but we just try and encourage green space all the time because our locations we've got green spaces like we've got 11 acres down in west wales where we've got gardening projects going on um polytunnel projects you know we're, we're renovating a cottage at the minute as well so um yeah that's just just a meeting place and a, and a safe environment for veterans and emergency services that's good mate what is the uh website so the website is um www.woodieslodge.org um and we're on facebook instagram and twitter as well so mega and how can people follow you you're on twitter aren't you you're on instagram i'm on i'm on yeah so instagram is call sign romeo on instagram um Twitter is Steve. Why call sign Romeo? Resilience. Like it. Like it. Like it. Yeah. Is there a, is there a brand coming there? Eh? Uh, I'm I, I'm I'm looking to do a bit of um, motivational stuff with with individuals, um, just to help them through some some stuff and you know just to yeah to help build their resilience. You know, knowledge is only as good as if you pass it on. Yes, there's another saying. Steve, you're banging him out. <laughs> banging him out. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah, absolutely bang on. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah so my, twi- my Twitter is uh, Steve O. So Steve Oscar Whiskey 2523. Got it. And then um, Facebook is just Steve Owen. Sweet. Yeah. Anything we haven't covered that you want to cover? No, it's We've good. Done it, we? Yeah. Be a good chat, mate. Really yeah, been good. yeah, me. Good. Yeah. Sweet. Right. Let's, uh, let's go meet Mr. Michael Valance. Yeah, tidy. Cheers, dude.